So my area of interest is inpatient uh, consultative medicine, dermatology specifically, and complex medical dermatology, hence the uh, collaboration with rheumatology quite frequently. Um, they're constantly seeing the zebras in the hospital and in clinics, so we're happy to work with them. Today, I'm actually excited to talk to you all about a, a pretty um, common uh, manifestations of uh, diabetes mellitus that we often see but get overlooked. Um, but when they do come up, everyone's sort of scratching their heads as to what it is and how we can help support our patients. Um, so in my training down at VCU, we got to see this often. And I don't know if it's just our patient population down there, certainly underserved, certainly um, poorly controlled diabetes was a factor. Um, but I also had some in incredible mentors who pointed out those uh, uh, those rare and, and difficult and, and easy to miss findings on clinical exams. So I'm happy to share some of that with you all today. So no financial disclosures to report at this time. So the objectives, so hopefully we'll be able to identify common and uncommon dermatologic manifestations of diabetes mellitus. From here on out, I'm just gonna call it DM. You guys all know what it is. Um, how to initiate a workup if it's, um, if it's these, you know, if it's A, feasible and B, necessary. Um, when those cutaneous uh, findings are identified. And then to identify some, some common and uncommon treatment options, you know, at some point you all can certainly start the treatment um, when you all see them in either primary care clinic or in the endocrine clinics. But of course, once things become uh, challenging or systemic uh, therapies are required, then by all means, send them our way. We're happy to take over. So just a very general overview, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the global prevalence of um, diabetes is around, it was around 9.3%. I'm just going to round up to 10% back in 2019, and I can only imagine that that number will continue to grow. The projected prevalence in the U.S. by 2050 would is, is as high as 20 to 30%, so incredible numbers there. Um, both quality of life and all-cause mortality are impacted by DM. And then the cutaneous manifestations, you can see it in up to 30 to 70% of patients with diabetes. So pretty astounding numbers when you think about it. Um, and it may precede or proceed diagnosis. And so when you find those stigmata, it's really important in doing our due diligence and screening those patients for underlying diabetes, counseling, lifestyle modifications, et cetera. And some of them, some of those cutaneous manifestations can portend to a poor glycemic control too. So important things to keep in mind. In terms of the pathogenesis, so why, why does diabetes have cutaneous manifestations? So the pathogenesis there has to do, it's pretty much multifactorial, like everything that we're dealing with. It has to do with hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia, and immune suppression. Um, so for the hyperglycemia component, it has a direct effect on both the keratinocytes and the fibroblast function. Um, the hyperglycemia, which also increases non-enzymatic glycation of proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, which are the building blocks of all our cells. It results in this advanced glycation of end products, which in turn alters our skin structure, skin function. Um, and that in itself, of course, changes the barrier, our cutaneous barrier, but it's also involved in pathogenesis of underlying vascular disease. So we all know that how much uh, small vessel disease we see in our uh, patients with diabetes. So vascular disease in itself and diabetes-associated immune suppression predisposes patients to poor wound healing and secondary infections. That's probably one of the things that I um, try to combat as, as much as I can when I see our patients and our um, complex wound care clinic here at Georgetown and on the inpatient service. And then hyperinsulinemia in itself alters keratinocyte proliferation, differentiation, and migration. And all of this to say that it diminishes that skin barrier function that we um, rely on so heavily, and then poor wound healing in itself too. And then of note, those cutaneous findings that we'll talk about today for the most part um, have poorly characterized pathophysiology and a definitive and definitive mechanisms. So it is an area of great interest for those who are interested in basic science research. It's not as well delineated or highlighted, but 
Um, we'll, we'll get into that in just a moment. There's two chats that I stopped for. No, no, no. Keep going. Okay. All right. So I'm, I, I tried to make this a smidge interactive for those of you who are here um, in the room with me. So what are examples of dermatologic manifestations of diabetes? Good. Acanthosis migrakins. Good. I'll give you guys a couple more seconds. <laughs> AN is very common. Can we see? Yeah, lipodermatous sclerosis. Good. All right. So I'm going to go through just a few. Yeah, good. Scleroderma. Yeah, these are yeah, these are good ones. I'll touch upon some of those, and then at the very end, I'll even highlight the ones that I just can't get to today because um, there are textbooks written about this. But I'll do my best. All right. So things to, that we'll discuss today are things diabetic dermopathy, which I'm sure you've all seen, and your patients have pointed out. And you're like, oh, that's nothing. You're okay. <laughs> nothing's bleeding. Nothing's oozing. Nothing's ulcerating. Guilty great. Um, acanthosis nigricans, which I think uh, we are um, uh, exposed to and taught about pretty early in our medical school career. So that's a good one to recognize and understand. Um, there's all the other other entities called necrobiosis lipoidica. It used to have the diabetic forum component to it, but that has fallen out of favor just because it's not always associated with diabetes. There's also a phenomenon called bolus diabetic forum. We tend to get consulted a lot for bolus dermatoses just because we're they're always concerned that there might be an autoimmune component, infectious component, but these tend to be completely sterile, uh, non-inflammatory, non-immune, non, it's, it's a non-autoimmune process. There's also another phenom phenomenon. We tend to see mostly in our end-stage renal patients, but we can see it in underlying diabetes as well, called acquired perforating dermatosis, and then granuloma annulare. All right, so let's get started. So we'll talk about diabetic dermopathy first here. So some, um, so it's cited as the most common cutaneous manifestation of diabetes. Um, and some experts will even argue that if you see diabetic dermopathy, it's almost nearly pathognomonic for having underlying diabetes. And I'll, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, clinical presentation, typically you see it on pink erythematous papules and plaques that over time will become more red, brown, brown to ovoid and atrophic. Um, and so that's a key marker there. They typically present on the bilateral pretibial distribution and are completely asymptomatic. So patients will, will bring it up to you like, doc, I don't really know what this is, not bothersome, it's not itching, it's not painful, it's not ulcerating, it's been there for a while. It's probably diabetic uh, dermopathy if they have underlying diabetes. Some things to recognize is that you can see it on other parts of the body too. So you can see it on forearms, the um, thighs, so pretty much anywhere, but mostly extremities. Um, diabetic dermopathy is associated with underlying coronary artery disease and microvascular complications, such as neuropathy, nephropathy, and retinopathy. Um, and nearly 20 1% of patients with DM will develop diabetic dermopathy over the lifetime of their diagnosis. Um, and those that have um, underlying coronary artery disease, microvascular disease are at higher risk for developing this. So typically, we're not sure what the etiology is, what that mechanism of, of action might be, or the pathophysiology. Some will argue, is it trauma-induced? Is it a hallmark of small vessel disease? It's really hard to know at this point, and a lot of research because I think there's no real significant um, complication associated with it, I don't think that there's a ton of research being happening at this point. Um, I think that usually science goes where, where the meat's at and it's just not quite here. In terms of treatment, I tend to not treat this at all. I'll, I'll point it out to patients if they want me to explain to them what it is, I'm more than happy to, but most often it's not something that I would I would be aggressive in terms of treatment because A, it's asymptomatic and it it really doesn't portend to any sort of worsening um, morbidity for the patients. I will say that it, it's also notable that um, improved glycemic control really doesn't um, determine the development of uh, diabetic dermopathy. And so um, there are other cutaneous manifestations that do um, uh, respond really well to better glycemic control, 
but in this case, not so much. And I wonder if that's because we tend to see this in elderly patients who've already had quite a few other complications and comorbidities. Um, so we tend to see this in an older population. Any questions? All right. So as a dermatologist, I love pictures. So I have scattered pictures throughout this talk, and I'll go into some of the descriptive terminology that we use here. Um, so I would describe this. Oh, sure. There we go. Is that better for you all? Yeah. Perfect. So I would describe these as more round, dull red papules um, that typically start off. And then over time, you'll get this clinical presentation, which over the course of several months to years, will have a more hyperpigmented brownish hue atrophic appearance to them. When I say papules and plaques, really the difference is that there's substance to it, either elevation or depression. And the only difference between a papule and plaque is size. Do you guys remember what that the cutoff is for size from a papule versus a plaque? Yes, wonderful. Wow, we got some budding dermatologists in here. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yes, one centimeter. Perfect. <laughs> got to think about it for a minute. Yeah, perfect. All right. And so here are some more clinical images um, of diabetic dermopathy. It can have a pretty, you know, significant appearance and, and it'll a lot of what we end up dealing with when we do see these sort of complications is the cosmesis component. Patients don't like that look. Um, so there are ways that we can, you know, help a little bit with um, keratolytics, softening creams, et cetera. But nothing is really going to get rid of that deep-seated um, hemocytorine deposition that's probably already um, in the skin there. But what you can appreciate is that hyperpigmented, ill-defined plaques. There are probably papules that are coalescing into plaques, some of them, and they're in different phases of development slash healing. So some are more papular, some are more plaque-like, and then others are more atrophic in appearance and sort of look more burnt out is how I would describe them. All right, our beloved acanthosis nigricans. So AN will be our next topic of discussion. The reason why this is so near and dear to my heart is that we see this a lot in young patients, too, um, especially over the last maybe 10 or 15 years where lifestyle obesity has is sort of, um, I would say, gone rampant in our society just due to poor lifestyle choices, being more sedentary. Um, and so typically um, we appreciate it also in patients of darker skin tones. So keep that in mind. Um, they are typically described as multiple poorly demarcated plaques because of, the, again, their size. Um, and they have a more grayish to dark brown hue to them. Um, and then if you were to actually run your fingers across this, it has that sort of velvety or verrucous texture to touch. And so you'll see a lot of that verbiage in our documentation. Typically, the distribution to make note of is that you can see it across the neck, which is probably the most visible place. You can see it in the axilla, elbows, and you can even see it on the palmar hands, and that's called trike palms. You can see it across the inframammary creases, umbilicus, and even groin region. So it has a pretty expansive um, presentation. So here you can see it across the neck. And then in these three pictures, what I wanted you all to appreciate is just the subtlety when it's in darker skin tones versus lighter skin tones. And so it's still the same. It's the same disease. You know, it's, a, it's the same cutaneous disease, but yet it looks quite different. Um, but it's the subtleties in, in skin tones is what I wanted you all to appreciate here. That hyperpigmentation, it's not going to have that classic brown appearance. It might look more slight gray and might not have as much erythema um it might there might be some maceration there depending on the the location right if it's in an occlusive area there might be some overlying maceration to try not to think of it as being infectious in that regard it's just of location you can even see it here on the dorsal hands so we tend to see a lot of hyperkeratosis you know we we tend to call it dry hands or retention hyperkeratosis, but this is in fact AM across the MCP and DIP joints here. 
So just a little bit of information on acanthosis nigricans. So again, hyperpigmented velvety papules and plaques, typically associated with insulin resistance. So we often see this in our patients who are overweight to morbidly obese. Um, and it's associated, as I mentioned, with the insulin resistance. And this has to do with the activation of insulin growth factor receptors, which lead to keratinocyte and dermal fibroblast hyperproliferation. Um, typically, clinical presentation is enough to cinch the diagnosis for most of us. We don't typically diagnose this um, with a biopsy. Um, unless we're favoring other diseases and if we're if we are in a diff, more of a differential diagnosis. Really, the only other things that I could think about, um, if it was more ill-defined and it was tracking into the trunk, you might want to consider CARP here as well. But I don't think that that, um, I think most often we would be able to give a clinical diagnosis. So in terms of other, other entities that AN can be associated with, it's not just um, uh, Diabetes, it can be associated with PCOS, which we know has underlying issues with metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance in itself, Cushing syndrome, and then most notably GI malignancies and certain medications. So the reason why I bring up malignant AN is that when you have mucosal surfaces that are involved or rapid appearance and or extension of your AN, along with other symptoms such as unintentional weight loss, B symptoms, et cetera, you have to consider it being um, a perineoplastic process. And so it's important, it's very important at that point to do a comprehensive malignancy workup. And most often it's associated with gastric um, adenocarcinomas. In terms of treatment, so we always, always, always counsel on diabetes management, so tight glycemic control, you can try keratolytic retinoids and chemical peels. Um, there aren't a whole lot of randomized control trials. We don't have those huge landmark studies that come out in New England Journal every month. Um, in the world of dermatology, a lot of what we rely on are case series, case reports, retrospective studies. Um, and in this case, I wanted to highlight one that just came out in 2022 and then actually made it into one of the podcasts that I um, and so in this particular study, um, it was a retrospective pilot study of 17 patients. And the study included six sessions of in-office chemical peels with a sal salicylic and a mandelic acid. Um, and they, um, uh, the affected sites that they targeted were axilla. And this was performed every two weeks. So it was a 12-week uh, treatment course. And in between the sessions, they had recommended and advised the patients to use a nightly cream of glycolic acid, urea, and cetylated fat esters, um, which was applied for a total of nine months duration. So from the time of the study and then beyond that 12-week mark when they did the chemical peel. As one can imagine, the most um, common adverse, pro adverse effect profile included post-chemical peel erythema, which we tend to see often with peels and then a burning sensation, which is very common with peels as well. But otherwise it was well tolerated. Um, most improvement was seen in both the pigmentation and the thickening of the plaques. But again, we're talking about a you know, group of 17 patients with an improvement scale of about anywhere from 20 to 40%. So there was some clinical improvement, but again, numbers are small, hard to decipher. I will say when our younger patients come in and we're sort of scratching our heads and they don't like the look, um, we certainly, of course, counsel on di their diabetes and insulin resistance, um, but we'll try and get creative with their with their treatment plan too. Um, I myself have never done a chemical peel, um, but I have tried the retinoids, I have tried <laughs> the keratolytics, um, and then I will have them apply a glycolic acid serum. So I have done that before. All right, so necrobiosis lipoidica, another um, pretty interesting phenomenon here. Um, this tends to, to this tends to have some complications associated with it, and so I would I would uh, I would recommend sending these patients our way um, only because if it's not treated or not monitored closely, they can ulcerate, and then you end up with the complications of ulcerations, which I'll get I'll, we'll get into. So. Clinical presentation, so 
It can either present as a single or a group of these firm, well-demarcated round to ovoid erythematous papules, which will eventually expand and or coalesce into plaques, which is what we can appreciate here. Um, the one on the left, I apologize, there's a little bit of a shine there, but hopefully you can see the edge of it. Um, it has, um, that looks a bit more active with the underlying erythema. And then the one to the right looks a little bit more burnt out. Um, they're best characterized as being more circumferential, where the red-brown active border, and then that firm yellow-brown waxy atrophic center, which we'll get, I'll show you all in the next slide, has a more um, atrophic center with prominent telangiectasias. I would say that's sort of a hallmark for NL, um, and that helps to um, make a clinical diagnosis. They tend to be more bilateral in predilection um, and mostly in the pretibial region, so again, lower extremities. However, rarely you can see it on other sites, um, including scalp, upper extremities, abdomen, and there are even some very rare um, reports of on the face, which I would say would be quite disfiguring if that were, um, if that does happen. All right. So here I wanted you all to appreciate what looks active. Um, and do you all see, so I'm just going to move away for just a moment, just to help the audience appreciate you guys see that sort of active reddish brown border and then that beige from the black and center is just from the telangiectasia. And it can over time have a more annular appearance, which means that central clearing. And then the one to more to the right um, looks a bit more active and certainly hasn't uh, become atrophic yet. So for those of you who are not as familiar with NL, it is an unusual and uncommon granulomatous inflammatory disease. And it typically affects about um, a very small number, I'll say less than 2% of patients with diabetes. Um, it has a predilection for more female than male, um, and it may precede the diagnosis of DM, so something to keep in mind. And then as I mentioned before, typically seen on the lower extremities, um, and then up to 35% of cases can become complicated with ulceration. So um, something to keep in mind here. Um, expert opinion suggests that patients with NL should also be screened for underlying hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and thyroid disease, as there is some association uh, uh, of NL with, with those other diseases as well. Of course. Is it usually type 2 diabetes? You can see it in type 1 as well. Yeah, I will get into that in just a moment. But yes, you can see it in, in type 1 and you can see it in type 2. Uh, good point. Usually, I will say for the others, so the diabetic dermopathy that we discussed, typically type 2 diabetes, acanthosis nigricans, typically type 2 diabetes, NL, I would say um, both type 1 and type 2 for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that also, I, I didn't mention this, it was just for brevity, but you tend to see NL in younger patients too. And so often I saw it a couple times in my training. Twice I saw it in middle-aged women, and then one time when I saw it at the VA, actually, it was in a really young patient with um, type 1 diabetes, and he unfortunately had it on his upper extremities. And so he was very displeased with the, the clinical appearance of it, and we tried our best to mitigate um, the appearance and also help a little bit. But yeah, good point. So... Pathogenesis, it's unknown, but there are some proposed mechanisms. So it was previously attributed to the glycosylation of collagen. That's sort of fallen out of the wayside. There are other um, proposed mechanisms. Some will argue that it's a T-cell-mediated hypersensitivity immune reaction where you have this re robust release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, lysosomal, lysosomal enzymes that lead to local tissue destruction. Um, there's another um, group of experts that argue that they might be a vas another vaso-occlusive phenomenon following the deposition of immunoglobulins and an activation of your complement cascade. So the jury is still out. I would say that there is some research ongoing, but nothing that's hit the publication world yet. So as I mentioned, up to a third of these patients can develop complications, and the complications that we're most worried about are ulceration. I mean, lower extremities are already prone to, to injury, trauma, 
um, for wound healing in our diabetic patients. And now you have this underlying cutaneous disease that can ulcerate. And so I would argue these patients should come to us um, just to help with, with compression, uh, mitigation of those complications. Um, once they've ulcerated, it, it can be challenging to treat these. So pain, secondary infection, and then chronic ulcers, the dreaded um, development of, of squamous cell carcinoma in lower extremity ulcers is, is something that we always keep in the back of our mind, especially when things are poorly healing or non-healing after several weeks and months. In terms of treatment, um, and depending on whether or not it's ulcerated or not, uh, we typically start off with topical steroids. And so you're not going to be applying that topical steroid in the portion of the lesion that's already atrophic and thinned out where you can see the prominent um, telangiectasias, where you tend to want to target your, your treatment is on that active border to halt any sort of inflammatory process. And so the mantra is always that you're treating that active border, whether it be with topical steroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors. Um, you can even try a, a low dose of intralesional Kenalog, though I've done it. It's quite painful for patients. They tend to not want to do that again. But if you can give them a quick fix or at least give them some sort of temporizing measure, ILK certainly will work. Um, some people will tack on a low dose aspirin, though I know that we, we tend not to do that in this day and age anymore. And then pentoxifiline, 400 milligrams, three times a day. Once it's ulcerated, um, you sort of take out the big guns. So we do oral steroids. You can do cyclosporin, mycophenolate, hydroxychloroquine, which is probably the safest of our systemic therapies, um, and then anti-TNF therapy as well if you're really out of options for your patient. So this was a uh, courtesy of my um, attending and mentor, Dr. Julia Nunley. Um, we had a patient with a uh, pretty significant NL that had these small ulcerations develop. And we did topical calcineurin inhibitor along with local wound care and compression. And that is within two months, uh, patient had healed up completely. I will say Dr. Nunley had a magic touch. She just, she knew what she was doing. She knew exactly how to treat. She had excellent follow-up and, and tried to teach all of those things to us. Um, she had her patients come in often and frequent to just monitor them. And so that was a big takeaway from this case for all of us is just to have close follow-up. It ended up never getting infected. It didn't expand on her. Um, and we got full re-epithelialization, which is pretty great. All right, another phenomenon called bullous diabetic forum. So these are uh, the tail ends of what what di bolus diabetic forum can look like. Unfortunately, I didn't have, I should have, but recently I had a patient who came into clinic with this, forgot to take a picture, but these are some, a little bit um, of a sort of long-term or long-standing bolus diabetic forum, but hopefully you guys can appreciate it here a little bit where that flaccid bullet was initially up above. And so we can see it's been completely derooted, which is not what we want to see in our bolus patients ever. Um, but unfortunately, this this has de-roofed at this point, and so you worry about secondary infections. Typically, the clinical presentation for bolus diabeticorum is that there's an abrupt onset, and they're usually asymptomatic. The patients really shouldn't be reporting any underlying itch, pain, burning. They tend to be more tense bolus, um, and usually that underlying skin as posse inflammatory, meaning that there really shouldn't be any erythema, swelling um, that, that should be appreciated. They can range in size, so they can be as small as, you know, 0.5 centimeters or 5 millimeters up to 5 centimeters in size. Typically, the acral sites um, and lower distal lower extremities are affected. Um, and then typically healing will occur spontaneously with just some local wound care within two to six weeks. And so you really don't have to do a whole lot for these patients. I will say once they get really large and they're tense and they're in your, in your office, if you feel comfortable, not everyone does. Um, we do it often though. We'll use an 18 gauge needle. And I mean, I clean the area as well as I can with alcohol, put a gauze chuck underneath them, make sure that there's like no risk of infection elsewhere on their lower extremity. Um, 
and I'll just use an 18 gauge needle and I'll just put like a couple of small little holes at the distal portion of the bole just to help with gravity and, and to allow for some of that um, pressure to be relieved and, and to drain. What I tend to never do, and you guys should never do this, never de-roof that bole. That, that, that intact skin will act as a natural band-aid for the patient and will slowly, once you get um, re-epithelization under that bole, that will, that will slowly um, slough off without any sort of manipulation or de-roofing. All right. So once I've done that, um, like I mentioned, that bole will act as a natural bear band-aid, but I do recommend the use of barrier creams. My favorite is zinc oxide, desitin, aka baby butt paste. It works really, really well. Um, and then I typically will also recommend a foam dressing. So um, you know, I'm in the I'm in the wound care clinic, so I can get fancy with my foam dressings, anywhere from Hydrofair Blue to Metplex. For those of you who are in the primary world and, and don't have access to all those fancy things, even something as simple as the alevin dressing will work just fine, just so long as that bordered uh, tape around it isn't directly on that bole and it's all around intact skin, it should be fine to use. And then I usually recommend if there's even hint of pitting edema there, um, I, I recommend compression stockings for these patients from toes to at least knees. Any questions? No? All right, good. So I went over some of this, but just so that you all know, pathogenesis is unknown. Um, it's not associated with trauma. It's not a primary blistering disorder. So a lot of oftentimes we get consulted because they're concerned for bolus pemphigoid or EBA, um, especially in our elderly patients. But most often we can reassure them that it's not that. And then typically these don't really scar. There might be some residual hyperpigmentation, but they tend to not scar. And I think the reason why that is, is most, so histologically, it could either be an intraepidermal or subepidermal blister. Usually with subepidermal blisters, there is some residual um, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, maybe a, a bit of scarring. But if it's intraepidermal and you have an intact um basilar to like DA junction, like dermal epidermal junction, then you then you won't get that scarring phenomenon. All right. Any questions? So this is a little bit more rare. So we're getting into the rare stuff, but I'm sure have you all seen eruptive xanthomas beyond what's in textbooks? No. Okay. I have seen this a few times, but I think it's just because of our clinic space. So eruptive xanthomas, they tend to appear as glossy yellow, red, brown papules, and they can vary in size. Usually they're, they're pretty small though. I will say they're anywhere from one to five millimeters in diameter. Distribution, because there's a phenomenon called kevnerization, um, which is that you induce eruptive xanthomas in sites of injury or trauma. We tend to see them most often on extensor surfaces. So think about elbows, knees, and then even the buttocks. Um, they're typically asymptomatic. They can, they can be pruritic. So if a patient reports some itch, pruritus, don't be alarmed. It, it can be an association. I wanted you all to appreciate. So some, you know, you guys see that sort of glossy yellowish hue. Some would, in picture, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fault anyone to think that that might be pustular or vesicular just because of its look. But when you guys see it in person, it, they're quite firm and there's no expression of any sort of purulence or drainage. All right. So, yes. Is there a root of that? Is there? I'm sorry? If they scratch it or something coming. Um, they they tend to be firm. So what gives them that that yellowish hue, which I'll get into in the histology, is that you have so much lipids there that macrophage activation happens, and they start to chomp up on those uh, lipids, and then they just tend to create what what are called foam cells. So you get these grain. It's a granulomatous process essentially. Um, and so no, you you tend to not get like an expression. Which is good because that would be quite quite painful. So it is a rare cutaneous manifestation of diabetes. It's often associated with elevated uh, serum triglycerides in patients with poorly controlled DM. So this is actually one of those phenomenon where if you get good control of your underlying diabetes, 
and triglycerides, you can get a resolution of this cutaneous um, disease process. It's also um, associated with other types of hyperlipidemia 1, 4, and 5, and then oral retinoid therapies, which we tend to use uh, a lot and often. So patients who are on um, chronic doses of acetretin, most often we don't uh, typically use isotretinoin in that way, but you can, but it's most often in our patients with acetretin who are either lost a follow-up or we've stopped checking for whatever reason a lipid profile, which you should never, but that can happen. Um, they can develop eruptive xanthomas because while you're on oral retinoids, you can get an elevated triglyceride. So the pathogenesis, I think, in this um, for this disease phenomenon is actually well studied and, and well known. So there is a there is an enzyme called the lipoprotein lipase, which is a key enzyme in the metabolism of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins, and this enzyme is is typically stimulated by insulin. So when there's a deficiency in insulin, this leads to decreased enzyme activity, which then results in the accumulation of chylomicrons and other um, triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. And what happens is when you have these increased lipoproteins, it's in the skin too, they're scavenged by macrophages, which then collect within the dermis, and that leads to eruptive xanthoma. So that's why it's a granulomatous process. That's why you're going to see a lot of what we call two-ton. Um, two-ton giant cells, et cetera. So they become foamy looking. Um, treatment is usually tight glycemic control and then lowering of your triglyceride levels. Um, and that can happen with your phenofibrates, omega-3 fatty acid therapies, et cetera. All right. So unfortunately, I have seen applied perforating dermatosis often, both here and where I trained. Um, and we typically see this in patients who have a ton of comorbidities, most notably unstage renal disease and diabetes as well. So these tend to look on clinical presentation. They have a more of a hyperkeratotic umbilicated papules and nodules where it has that central keratin plug. So again, it has, do you guys, can you appreciate that umbilication in the center? And what's actually filled in that umbilication is, is keratin debris. And I'll get to that uh, as to why that occurs in just a moment. This is also associated with Kevnar phenomenon. So trauma will induce more lesions to occur, uh, which is why we often, again, see them on extensor surfaces. So think pressure points, so extensor, so elbows, knees. We see it often on the hands, dorsal hands. I just recently diagnosed that in a patient. Um, and then you can also see it on lower extremities. All right, here you can appreciate they're a little bit smaller, but they have that, if you just, you can discern it on some of the papules that central umbilication, which I think is really helpful. So for acquired perforating dermatoses, so this is a broad group of chronic cutaneous disorders that are best characterized by the loss of dermal connective tissue. Most often we see these in patients with underlying end-stage renal disease, on dialysis, and diabetes um, mellitus. It's often associated with a ton of pruritus. So patients aren't so much bothered by the, the appearance in this case because they have so much else going on, but it's that inter underlying itch component that is really, really bothersome to these patients. Pathogenesis, there are some proposed models that it might have to do with repetitive trauma, glycosylation, or accumulation of immunogenic substances. My my money is on the accumulation of the immunogenic substances only because patients, I'll get into this in just a moment, but patients who end up with renal transplant, this completely clears and their generalized paritis also clears. Um, otherwise, dialysis doesn't clear these patients, tight glycemic control doesn't clear these patients, but transplant somehow does. Treatments are often um, difficult, I didn't want to use the word futile, but, but difficult to treat. We'll often start with topical steroids, high potency, potency steroids. So don't shy away from, from using at minimum a beta methasone, triamcinolone. Um, and I would even argue you could bump up to a clobetasol ointment or cream. Um, you can also try calcineurin inhibitors, topical calcineurin inhibitors. Those are difficult though. They're not as, as effective. And then once they come to us, we begin to think about cryotherapy, which we have readily in our clinics, narrowband UVB therapy, which we again have in our clinics. It does take a commitment of them coming in two to three times a week for it. 
And then um, there's an there's an argument and a lot to be said about using dupilumab as well now. Um, it is FDA approved for parigonodularis, and some would argue that this is on that spectrum of, of parigo too. So something to keep in mind. So as I mentioned, dialysis doesn't help these patients, tight glycemic control doesn't, but renal transplantation does. All right, here are some more images, clinical images of what it can look like. So it has that sort of firm, hyperkeratotic, hyperpigmented papules and nodules. There is quite a bit of substance to them, so I would argue they, they should be considered more nodules than papules. Question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I will biopsy it only when I think. So I did biopsy my other previous patient, and the reason why I biopsied her, it was on the dorsal hands. Um, I was concerned because they had been there for so long that maybe there was an infectious component. That's why I biopsied her. Typically these, we can give a clinical diagnosis, but if you are, you know, if you all are concerned about calciphylaxis, certainly we can. I will say calciphylaxis appears very different. So those tend to be more on fatty tissues. So think about more proximal, so thighs, gluteal region, posterior thighs, abdomen. Those tend to be really, really painful. These are not typically painful. and it, because calciphylaxis is in the, is in the, in the ischemic process. So it's a little bit different. You're going to see more initially sort of that violaceous rediform purpura develop and then rapid progression to ulceration and eschar formation. So a little bit different. These patients tend to show up more in a subacute to chronic phase of their disease process. Okay. The great That's question. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's a microvascular issue. This is truly, if, if you guys, you know, I wish we had live patients, but, you know, these, you can see they're raised, they're firm, and they do have that keratotic debris. They, it's like a whitish hue. So it's an actual expulsion of your um, collagen um, because you just don't have that intact barrier anymore. Yeah. All right. Granuloma annulare. So this was near and dear our, to our hearts. For some reason, we had a ton of these patients uh, where I trained, but I haven't seen a whole lot here while I've been here for the last eight or nine months. But um, this is also associated with uh, diabetes mellitus. So um, clinical, clinical presentation can vary for GA, and I think because it has such a wide clinical presentation to begin with, and it just really just depends on the subtype that it is. But most often, you'll see the generalized form in patients with underlying diabetes. So they typically are firm, skin-colored to reddish papules that are, tend to be very indolent, so very slow-growing. They will centrally involute, so meaning that you'll have a raised um, border. A circum so it's usually circumferential, raised border, and then more of a, I wouldn't necessarily say atrophic, but certainly depressed center. Um, or at least flattened out. Um, and they can also vary in size. So they can be anywhere from just a few millimeters to several centimeters in diameter. And they are often seen on the trunk and extremity. So um, you don't really see a lot of head and neck um, involvement, um, but you do will see it trunk, extremities, hands, and dorsal feet, most common sites. Here's just another clinical presentation of GA. Um, you know, we just saw NL. You can see why you could potentially consider NL here because you guys can see that sort of um, uh, annular appearance where it has an active raised border. But what you don't appreciate here is that sort of yellowish waxy hue to the center or the atrophy um, or the prominent telangiectasia. So some subtle subtleties there. This is more of the generalized form. So you could, when, and when we say generalized, we really do mean generalized. So pretty much extremities, trunk, um, trunkal involvement. Um, they again have a more annular appearance, raised borders, flattened out center. So it's a very common granulomatous disease. We see this even in our pediatric patients, young adults and adults. There is a little bit more of a female to male predilection, so a two to one ratio. 
It can occur at any age, and most often it's seen in younger patients. So up to 66% are seen in those who are yet less than the age of 30. And then, as I mentioned, really clinical presentation is quite varied. So anywhere from localized to generalized, nodular, perforating, subcutaneous, and deep. Oftentimes, we end up biopsying GA because it's a dermal process, and you really don't know a dermal process what it could be. It could be, it could be GA, it could be sarcoid, um, it could be infectious, um, it could be NL. So lots of different things will will give you a dermal component to your pathology, and if they're really subtle epidermal changes, meaning that top layer and there's not a whole lot of substance, it's hard to make a clinical diagnosis. So these we tend to biopsy more often. And then rarely it's associated, again, with diabetes, lymphoma, thyroid disease. Most often, if you're going to see a generalized form of GA, you should screen and rule out and assess for diabetes and underlying thyroid disease. And then doing a, doing a comprehensive review of systems is also important here. Treatment options. There really aren't really good treatment options. These tend to sort of spontaneously resolve anywhere from months to years, though. A lot of young patients, their parents don't want to wait, and so we tend to treat. But again, not a whole lot of good treatment options. As you can imagine, because this is a dermal process, topicals aren't really going to cut it. So you end up having to use systemic therapies, anywhere from hydro, um, hydroxychloroquine, which are antimalarials, retinoids, systemic steroids, if it's generalized. You can try Dapsone, Cyclosporin, UVA, which I know um, has, it, we don't have it here, but it's fallen out of favor over the years, but it is an option. Um, but there's not a whole lot of good treatment. Some, some will argue you can do intralesional steroids. You just have to make sure that your depth is appropriate so you don't cause inadvertent atrophy. And also young kiddos really don't like to be stuck. So keeping that in mind too. What? I'm sorry? No, it doesn't. So it's not, it's just, it's very, this one is actually quite random. And I just wanted to show you guys a couple more pictures and get to the pathogenesis. So it's not well understood why this happens. But some people argue that there is some, we haven't figured out what might that stimulus be, but there is an unknown stimulus that leads to the activation of lymphocytes through a delayed type hypersensitivity reaction, which then causes a pro-inflammatory cascade and granuloma formation. So no, it does not pretend to poor glycemic control or um, poorly controlled diabetes in general. You know, I, it's pretty interesting because you see it in, in like young, really young children too. Um, my money's on that it's a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. We just don't know what that stimulus might be as to why diabetics are more, um, we see it off, not often, but we see it enough in, in diabetics that, that there is an association there as to that why that might be. I don't know if it's just because they're already immune suppressed and they're just more prone to developing delayed hypersensitivity reactions. The jury's still out on that, not 100% sure. Any other questions? Um, I'm just impressed how many of these different rashes are granulomatous in nature. Yeah. And just a question of how often do they get mixed up with sarcoid? Um, it de like once they're biopsy. Yeah. Oh, you can tell the difference. So uh, I didn't include it today because I, I just based off of our audience, but next time I'm more than happy to, I can add histologic images. Histo histologically, they look different. So um, for sarcoid, they're the naked um, granulomas that we're all familiar with, um, non, yeah, non casating granulomas. And then for GA, it, it's a palisading granuloma. And so it looks very, very different. It's probably one of the things I missed most often when I was a uh, rapid fire path uh, for us because it's so subtle. So it's this very like it, it's an interstitial process. It's round. There's like very barely any lymphocytes and histiocytes. And then right in the center, you'll see a little bit of necrobiosis, which means a degeneration of collagen. So while clinically it looks impressive, histologically it can it can vary, but it, it can be subtle. And oftentimes it is. Yes. I was wondering if you noticed a uh, predisposition or connection between specific oral diabetic agents patients are on. Mm -hmm. and, 
Yeah. Well, uh, so I didn't get into it because I, I just for the sake of time, I mean, there are the newer agents certainly have a lot of uh, uh, cutaneous adverse profiles associated with them, most notably in the last few years. Um, bolus pemphigoid has come up quite a bit. Um, in terms of oral versus insulin, I mean, there are there are other entities that are associated with just insulin use. So, like, you could get lipoatrophy with chronic insulin use, or you can even get lipo um, hypertrophy with that. I don't think this. I don't think enough studies have been done to really parcel out diabetics, those who are on oral agents, those are who are on injectables, and then long-standing insulin. I don't think that that study um, has been done yet. It also would be really hard to do because a lot of the time patients, especially nowadays, like they're on a bunch of different things, right? So I think that would be really, it would be a challenging study. Not totally unreasonable, but I didn't come across it in my research. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to give you all a list. Don't freak out. But there are other cutaneous manifestations of diabetes that I did not get to today. Um, and I will slowly, I'll quickly go through what they are. So diabetic foot ulcers in itself is, is probably a, a two hour, three hour uh, course that you can probably take at a conference. Um, and there have been textbooks dedicated to it. The scleroderma like skin changes that we've talked about. So that's usually a thickening of the skin. We often see that um, on, on the trunk, upper back. Yeah. Yeah. It's that sort of thickening and almost a potorange appearance, clinical appearance, so that rippling effect uh, of um, their upper back region, most often seen in men. Um, generalized pruritus, which I think we, we get co uh, consulted on and, and you all probably have to comment on quite a bit for your patients, or underlying xerosis in itself. Um, and then it can even, even xerosis can become more of an ichthyosiform change on the pretibial region. So it has that fish uh, fish scale-like appearance to their skin. Um, pigmented purpuric dermatoses um, can be seen in patients with underlying um, diabetes. You can have yellow skin and nail changes. So we often get um, patients that come through our clinic for dystrophic nails, and it ends up not being that they have underlying um, fungal infections. I tend to not treat these patients for that reason blindly, so I will send off nail clippings for both culture and H and E PAS stain, um, because often these patients don't have underlying onychomycosis, but it's their under, underlying diabetes that have caused either dystrophy, thickening, um, or discoloration of their nails. Um, onychocryptosis, this is just a fancy way of saying ingrown toenails, which we often see. So those patients probably should get at least a podiatry eval every year, every couple years, uh, just to help with their um, overall uh, foot care, um, because what that tends to be from uh, weight, um, weight bearing, microvascular disease, all, all those other things that they need to be assessed for. So those patients, I would say, should be um, screened a little bit more closely for underlying neuropathy, um, et cetera. And then you can see often skin infections. So patients with underlying diabetes are more prone to fungal infection. So treating tinea pedis is often prudent um, because that becomes a nidus for other more um, problematic infections. Uh, most often you worry about gram negatives in these patients, but also staph and stroke. And then you can see vitiligo, lichen planus, and psoriasis. And I think we're all well familiar with the um, correlation of psoriasis with underlying um, cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. 